Thanks for coming out, everyone. This is a great problem to have, not enough seats, so I'm happy to see that. I'm Tom Lenny. I'm the director of the McFarland Center for Religion, Ethics, and Culture. This is our home in Ream Library. Uh, the McFarland Center sponsors and supports lectures, discussions, conferences, performance, performances, exhibits, and faculty workshops that explore questions of basic, basic human questions of meaning, morality, and mutual obligation. I'm really pleased that we're all here today for two reasons. Uh, the first is that I have the honor of welcoming to Holy Cross an extraordinarily talented but modest individual uh, uh, who's served our country in many important ways. He's also the friend of a, uh, the brother of a good friend of mine and as uh, kind and wonderful as his brother is. So um, he's a man, one political story described echoing House Speaker Nancy Pelosi as Obama's Obama for the similarities she saw between the two men. Second, I'm pleased to be here to talk about what I think is probably the most consequential moral issue of our day, the situation of refugees. Americans too often seem oblivious to it, but we are today in the midst of the greatest refugee crisis since the Second World War. Think of that. There are more refugees in the world right now than there were in the aftermath and the carnage of World War II. Difficult as it is to figure out how to respond adequately and appropriately to such massive need, I believe that we Americans and the politicians we elect have failed to live up to our moral obligations on this front. Other countries around the world have failed too, and it's not controversial or especially insightful to call attention to the fact that so many of the populist, even authoritarian governments that we see today have risen to the fore on the wings of fear-monging over refugees as a primary issue. Here at Holy Cross, we're compelled to consider, as a Jesuit institution, what our special responsibility is to the world's poor and powerless, like refugees. So today I'm pleased to welcome a man who's been in on some of the nation's most complex foreign policy matters to speak about our responsibilities to refugees on global, national, and local levels. Dennis McDonough served as the White House Chief of Staff to President Obama. The role of Chief of Staff, as many of you know, is to serve as the primary gatekeeper to the President of the United States, to manage White House staff smoothly, to manage information flow and access to the president day to day and actually minute to minute, I suspect, to help manage crises and help, to help create space to think creatively and strategically. In important ways, McDonough was not only a talented manager, he was a trusted and decisive advisor to the president on key decisions. I was in the uh, Museum of African American History over the weekend. I was in Washington, we were talking about it, and there's a great and famous picture of you in there, a famous picture from the briefing room when. Uh, uh, Saddam, when uh, uh, Osama bin Laden was taken out and sitting right there in the middle is Dennis looking very intent there in the Museum of African American History uh, with President Obama and, uh, and other people. Even before the current administration, when we've been through some chiefs of staff, uh, most of them don't last very long. They burned out or lost the president's trust. Dennis McDonough was chief of staff for the entirety of President Obama's second term in office, 2013 to 2017. He was at the center of everything that happened. He provided strategic advice to the center, to the president, on the most important uh, domestic policy, national security, and management issues facing the federal government. During President Obama's first term, Dennis served as principal deputy national security advisor, among other positions before that, and led a multi-agency team to address the Iran nuclear negotiations, strategic arms re reduction talks with Russia, United States rebalance in Asia, the Afghanistan surge, and the Iraq drawdown. I'd hate to compare what I did in that period with any of those, those tasks, <laughs> right? Prior to his eight-year tenure at the White House, McDonough served chief lead, held leadership positions and served as foreign policy advisor and legislative director in the U.S. House and Senate, lastly working for a new senator named Barack Obama as his chief foreign policy advisor. Today, he is senior principal at the Markle Foundation, working on labor force training and technology, executive fellow at the Global Policy Initiative at Notre Dame's Keough School of Global Affairs and visiting senior fellow with the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. A Minnesota native with Boston area roots, he holds degrees from St. John's University in Minnesota, a wonderful Benedictine institution that I visit often and know well and have great affection for. And at, uh, he graduated from Georgetown University's School of Foreign Service as well. He lives in Maryland with his wife and three children. So please join me in welcoming Dennis McDonough for a talk titled Thanks so much, John. Excellent. Well, thanks so much, Tom. It's, it's uh, 
real joy to be here. I uh, reached out to a couple of my uh, former colleagues before I came uh, who happen to be Holy Cross alums, John Favreau and uh, Roderick Johnson, and both uh, expressed their extreme jealousy that I got to come here to the uh, top of Mount St. James to address you all. So thank you all very much for the opportunity to be here. Um, I'm reminded of a moment about a week into being chief of staff when I got a call around lunchtime from the president's personal secretary and she said, uh, president's in the dining room and he'd like to see you. And I said, okay, and tried to play it cool. So I checked the calendar and, and about lunchtime, so that's good. And on his calendar, it says he's eating lunch alone. So of course, naturally I came to a simple conclusion, which is I've just been invited to lunch with the president. <laughs> Pretty sweet job being chief of staff, have lunch with the president. So I walk down the hallway and I walk into the president's private dining room and there's one place setting in front of him. He directed me to sit down and it didn't take me long to figure out that I wasn't there to eat. I was there because I was on the menu. <laughs> and the president uh, did me a solid that day because he really chewed me out wasn't happy with what I was doing. And the solid he did is he did that behind closed doors because had he done that in front of our team, I'm not sure I'd have recovered. I'm not sure I would have been able to regain their trust and their uh, respect for my leadership. But I drew a second lesson there, which was uh, what a mistake I made. So convinced I was going to have you know, nice lunch with the president that I didn't prepare myself for the meeting. I didn't prepare myself to do exactly what he hired me to do, which is to tell him the truth. Tell him what he needed to hear, not what he wanted to hear. So after that day, I started carrying around a notepad like this all day, every day, which, on which I'd write down notes of things I knew I needed to raise with him so that even if I was caught off guard and was unprepared, for my discussion with him, that I was ready to give him feedback too. So that when he'd get whatever he had on his chest off his chest, I could tell him, okay, thanks Buster, I got a couple things to share with you too. <laughs> so it's in that spirit that I'm here today to talk about exactly what Tom said, which is one of the biggest challenges we face and what I consider to be our responsibility, namely refugees. It's quite clear that here at Holy Cross, you're already beginning to meet that responsibility, including in the city of Worcester. Through the Holy Cross Student Program and Urban Development, I understand that students are volunteering with the Worcester Region, uh, Refugee Assistance Program and the African Community Education Group to tutor newly arrived refugees after school. Others are working with agencies such as the Worcester Alliance for Refugee Minister, Ministry to help refugee, refugees assimilate, setting up an apartment upon arrival, providing furniture, teaching refugees how to drive, showing them how to navigate grocery stores, inviting them to social gatherings, becoming mentors and friends. And through the work of the college's own professor, Susan Rogers, will soon have a critical piece of research that will broaden the understanding of resilience and strength of this extraordinary group of people. So congratulations to Professor uh, for Rogers for the Scholarship and Action Grant. Your anthropological ethnography will be an inval invaluable research, a resource once completed, not just for refugees here, but around the country. So at a time when colleges and universities are struggling, particularly Catholic colleges and universities, are struggling to define their role in the world and in this economy, I think, Tom, Holy Cross has found a way to further integrate itself into the community, not separate itself from the community. Guided by the Jesuit principle of men and women for and with others, you encourage your students, faculty, staff, and alumni to participate on campus and in the world beyond it. The guiding question of Holy Cross mission statement is to ask, what are, your what are our obligations to one another, 
What is our special responsibility to the world's poor and powerless? From the Worcester community to the locations across the country and overseas, you're challenged to understand the world around you, how to make it a better, more compassionate place. It's an astoundingly important assignment and how badly it's needed with this issue of migration in the world today. As Tom said, according to the UNHCR, by the end of 2017, 68.5 million people were forcibly displaced worldwide as a result of prosecution, conflict, or generalized violence. A number that has increased 2.9 million in 2017 alone. 25.4 million of those people have been forced across an, across an international line and are considered refugees. The highest number since 1990 following the fall of the Berlin Wall. 40 million are internally displaced people forced from their homes but still, in many cases, trapped in their own country. Importantly, 13.4 million refugees were in protracted refugee situations by the end of 2017. So what does that mean? It means they've been in a situation lasting 38 years or more, dominated by 2.3 million Afghan refugees in the Islamic Republic of Iran and Pakistan, whose displacement situation began in 1979 much longer than many of you have been alive. So migration is a big, long-lasting problem. By any indication, it's getting bigger by the day, even as our national debate about it gets, unfortunately, as we saw last night, smaller. We can clearly anticipate that changes in the climate will have a pronounced impact on migration, especially from Africa. The total population of Africa will grow from the current 1.2 billion people to 2.5 billion people by 2050. Just as the intense impacts from climate change that international climate scientists have warned of come due, the combination, that combination of poverty, dependence on agriculture, environmental degradation, and population growth are creating a vicious cycle which can be expected to translate into increasing forced migration. By 2050, according to some estimates, if no action is taken, there will be more than 140 million internal climate migrant, migrants across three regions, 86 million in Sub-Saharan Africa, 40 million in South Asia, 17 million in Latin America. So what do we do? And those forced to move, by the way, will be the poorest, most vulnerable, as farming becomes less productive, water more scarce, and housing washed away by rising sea levels. So what do we do about this, and why? And three stories, one about Mohammed, one about Matt, and one about Minneapolis. I want to make the case that here in the United States, the answer to what we need to do be, can, can be found in our country's own story, which is to say the cure to what ails us is exactly us. Simply put, we need to be more of what we have been since the early post-World War II years when this campus exploded for education of all those returning GIs. We need to be more of what we are, not less. So let me tell you about Mohammed. I met him and his family at Azraq Camp in Jordan, the second biggest camp in that country, last July. He and his family invited my colleagues and me into their home and fed us sweets coffee and fresh fruit. Mohammed told us their story. They had fled from homes in Syria in 2016. After spending a week with the Bedouins, he paid about, two, about 250 US dollars to hire a taxi to take his wife, their five kids, and him to the border with Jordan, where they waited six and a half months to be granted passage into that country. Since then, they've been at that camp in Azraq. At the camp, Mohammed, the man who had fed us and invited us into his home, agreed that his family, which was already seven people, small compared to mine, which is 11, but nevertheless quite big, would take yet another child into their family to provide foster care for him. His name was Ferris, 
a smart but rambunctious, unaccompanied minor, Syrian, himself a refugee. He agreed to take in Ferris, he said, because the young man needed mentoring and parenting. I'll never forget talking with Mohammed. He missed his home, he said, but was determined to make the most of his life in Jordan and insisted that he would one day return home though not at the risk of his sons being forced into the Syrian army. He had built a remarkable life in that camp, proud of his job as a soccer coach, and was determined to provide for his family there. I remember thinking that aside from the number of kids, he had five, I have, my wife and I have three, we weren't really that different. A little younger, he probably had less gray hair. Then my friend asked Mohammed, how do you stay so positive even after all these developments in Syria and here in Jordan? He said, impossible does not exist for me. Impossible does not exist for me. We know right now that there are millions of men and women, fathers and mothers like Mohammed around the world. Under the 1951 Compact on Refugees, the primary responsibility for caring for refugees lies with the neighboring countries. Given the numbers of refugees, there's no other way to do it. The implicit understanding in the international system is that we will take a very small number of the vulnerable refugees, we in the United States, to demonstrate our commitment and provide the resources to those other countries, those neighboring countries like Jordan, so that they can cope with the vastly greater numbers that they take in. Time and again, the poorest and least developed countries have not only hosted such enormous refugee populations, but have done so during the times of sudden crisis, when states have welcomed refugees on short notice with little certainty that any resources or international support will follow. For example, during 100 days in the fall of 2017, over 620,000 Rohingya from Myanmar fled to Bangladesh which welcomed them even though its GDP is about 1% of America's GDP. The vast majority of refugees remain close to their home principally because their ultimate goal is not to move somewhere else, like Worcester. <laughs> their goal is to return home. The countries that house refugees are often those least equipped to meet their needs. 88% of refugees living in low and middle income countries most remain, will remain there long term. Refugees are displaced now for an average of 10 years. And in 2017, less than 3% of refugees returned home. So the first thing we need to do is, here in the United States is to continue and increase consistent with the size of the challenge that Tom talked about earlier, the support to these frontline states like Jordan with critical funding while increasing our support for things like the right to work and dramatically expand access to education given the expended, extended periods of time, on average more than 10 years, that refugees spend in a state of refuge. The United States is a long and distinguished, has long and distinguished itself as the world's largest donor to refugee programming. In the, each of the last two years of this administration, however, the White House propo has proposed to cut U.S. funding for refugees. Congress rightly refused those cuts, and it should continue to do so. But we also know that providing resources is not enough. These states need to see that the care of refugees is a key priority for the United States itself. And the best way for us to show that is to resettle some refugees right here. Such resettlement from those countries of first refuge to a new state like America is reserved for the most vulnerable refugees those with safety, medical, or family reunification needs that cannot be resolved in host communities like Jordan. Only the most vulnerable, just 1% of refugees, even have access to resettlement. Today, 1.4 million refugees are in urgent need of resettlement. In 2018, just 100,000 refugees were resettled, down from the previous year's 180,000. And each year, the flow of new cases greatly outpaces the capacity and willingness of new countries to welcome them. In 15 years, it's estimated that the total number of refugees in urgent need of resettlement could double to at least 2.8 million. 
The resettlement process is also long, with the approval process taking several months or years while destination countries complete security checks and other paperwork. The United States has agreed to settle, resettle a very small portion of this overall, overall global population. Since 1980, we've resettled just 3 million refugees here, which is six-tenths of 1% of the global population each year. In return, we've benefited not only by getting an infusion of remarkable talent from these 3 million refugees, but we've garnered international burden sharing in places like Jordan for, those mass, for the massive challenge and mitigated this massive challenge, and we've mitigated regional conflicts whose broader expansion would surely threaten American interests and demand greater American resources. That brings me to Matt. It was about 1978 or 1979 that I met the Din family. My parents, with 10 kids of their own, sponsored the Din family for resettlement through our parish, St. Mike's. Millions of families and thousands of parishes had done the same thing in the late 1970s in the U.S. into the early 1990s when the United States resettled nearly a million Vietnamese refugees, overwhelmingly Catholic. Near the end of April 2015, my mom, already then falling prey to dementia, and my brother Bill went to, din went to dinner or went to lunch at Matt Din's restaurant in Stillwater. Matt, a small business owner and, highly, uh, and a mother of highly successful children now, all college graduates living all across the country, told my mom and my brother that uh, that week was a special week, she said, and that she had been thinking about my mom that whole week. Forty years previously, almost to the day in April 1975, Matt and her family had been in one of the last helicopters to leave Saigon. That day, the Din family started a long and arduous journey that ended in our small town of Stillwater three or four years later. You saved my life, Mrs. Din said to my mom. So what is it that we do today in light of this challenge, many times larger than the refugee challenge in Southeast Asia in the late 1970s? exactly what we've done for three million people like Matt Din. Maintain the historic commitment to refugee resettlement. Both here in the United States and in like-minded countries, we should also go get smarter on how and where we resettle refugees. We can begin by using technology, including matching algorithms, to increase employment options for skilled workers who come as refugees. In collaboration with the Stanford Immigration Policy Lab, the International Rescue Committee analyzed IRC and Lutheran Immigrant and Re Refugee Service data. After reviewing 70,000 refugees resettled by those two groups over the past five years, they concluded that their matching alg algorithm generated 45% increases in employment rates by more strategically resettling these refugees. In Switzerland, a similar retrospective analysis suggested that applying this machine learning algorithm would generate an 80% increase in job placement. Why is this? Because we know now that location is one of the biggest predictors of wealth, intergenerational mobility, and welfare in the United States, and also elsewhere, by the way. If you move from Atlanta to Minneapolis, for example, your chance of starting in the bottom fifth and moving to the top fifth of income distribution doubles. If you move from Charlotte to San Jose, it triples. Resettlement offers the opportunity to decide where you locate people, leveraging data so it's most impactful. We can also look at new ways to sponsor resettled refugees, just like you do here in Worcester, the students at Holy Cross. In Canada, privately sponsored refugees enter the labor market more quickly than government-assisted refugees and earn double on average, that is, say, $20,000 a year, 
That's because sponsors help refugees navigate their new communities as Holy Cross students help new refugees of Worcester navigate supermarket aisles, providing social support, access to networks, and an in-community safety network. Through the work of Professor Rogers, I learned that Pa Wa, a refugee from Myanmar, who waited six years before accept, being accepted for asylum in the United States, and another two years to have her foster son approved to travel with the rest of her family. When Pa Wa and her family arrived in Worcester in September 2008 with just 20 bucks in their pocket, they faced significant challenges. They did not have a job or a car, were entirely reliant on the caseworker to provide food. But after the caseworker stopped showing up, as refugees are only entitled to three months of assistance under our current programming, Pawa had no other option but to wander around the unfamiliar neighborhood to seek out churches that might help. Over time, they began to make connections in the city, and the family began to thrive. Her husband now works at FedEx, receiving commendations as a model employee. Her children have come to excel ex academically. And now, Pawa, an American citizen, has continued to give back to include by adopting nine foster children and raising them until they turn 18. For her efforts, Pawa was honored in 2016 as one of Worcester Magazine's five hometown heroes. Her hometown wasn't always Worcester, by the way. This all stands to reason because in many ways this is the story of immigration to the United States. It's surely the story of the McDonough's and the O'Manis and their arrival about 100 years ago in South Boston. And all your families. They fell into a network of other Irish immigrants and advanced, eventually moving out of South Boston to more affluent towns and then hosting new arrivals like Colm Lydon. who arrived in Boston from the same small town outside of Galway City as my grandfather. Combe, my cousins, now the deputy superintendent of the Boston PD. That brings me to Minneapolis. Congresswoman Ilhan Omar was elected to the U.S. House of Representatives from Minneapolis last November. She was born in Somalia and was eight when that country's civil war began. She remembers militiamen preparing to attack the male members of her family in Mogadishu only to be spared because her older female relatives recognized the voices of the militiamen as their classmates and they convinced the militiamen to leave her family in place, in peace. Her family left Somalia shortly thereafter, sneaking out of Mogadishu in the middle of the night, walking through streets, she wrote, strewn with debris and corpses. Her family spent four years in the, in the Utanga camp near Mombasa. At the age of 12, she, her parents, and six brothers and sisters resettled first in Virginia, then moved to Minneapolis in 1997. About the time that you moved here, it sounds like. Her interest in politics began at the age of 14 when she was an interpreter for her grandfather at caucus meetings for the DFL. That's what we call Democrats in Minnesota, the DFL. Omar graduated from North Dakota State University and began her political career doing public health outreach for the University of Minnesota. In 2016, at age of 33, she became the first Somali-American woman to win a seat in the, in the Minnesota House, unseating a 44-year incumbent. Last month, on the eve of her congressional swearing-in ceremony, she returned to the same Washington, D.C. airport that she served, that she arrived in as a refugee when she first came to the United States. She wrote, 23 years ago, from a refugee camp in Kenya, my father and I arrived at an airport in Washington, D.C. Today, we return to the same airport on the eve of my swearing-in as the first Somali-American member of Congress. Now, it's true that Omar is the first Somali-American member of Congress and the first woman of color in Minnesota's congressional de delegation, but her story is as Minnesota as any other story. It's the same story as the Norwegian farmers who settled in western Minnesota, Swedish and Irish, Irish workers who settled in Minneapolis to build the flour mills, build and man the flour mills, 
or Balkan immigrants who settled on the Iron Range in northern Minnesota to work in the iron ore mines. Refugees have shown a particular willingness to make long-term investments in the country. A 2017 study by the New American Economy found that 84% of refugees who have been in the country for 16 to 25 years have taken the step of becoming citizens. More than 57% of all refugee households also own their homes. And in 2015, the United States was home to more than 180,000 refugee entrepreneurs, creating businesses which generated $4.6 billion in income that same year. So what is it that we have to do in the face of today's global refugee crisis? We need to keep being what has made the United States strong for more than two decades. Open, inviting, constantly renewing ourselves in the idea of America. Now it might sound hopelessly naive. And in light of the discourse taking place today and even just last night in the House chamber, I get it. But if we don't make the arguments, nobody will. And by the way, when we do make the argument, it works. It was more than three years ago that the horrendous attack on the Bataclan in Paris followed a horrendous attack on a holiday party in San Bernardino, California. Left successive governors in this country threatening to refuse to allow any refugees to resettle in their states, suggesting that refugees posed a terrorism threat, even though we have never had a terrorist attack by a refugee. We've never had a terrorist attack by a refugee. None of those governors succeeded in stopping refugees being resettled in their states. And in the two years that followed, we saw historically high levels of resettlement activity across the country, thanks to President Obama's insistence. Incidentally, it was Archbishop Tobin, a redemptorist, not a Jesuit, who led personally Syrian refugees to be resettled in Indianapolis over the objections of then Governor Pence. And that's because Americans see ourselves as a country of refugees. That's the result of last November's election, when according to one conservative commentator, it resulted in the most pro-immigration House of Representatives since the 19th century. In fact, the Pew Research Center found that 13% of lawmakers in the 116th Congress are immigrants or are children of immigrants. And in the recent International Rescue Committee-led focus group of Republican voters, participants believed, quote, that helping children and families and keeping them safe and protected from violence is an American value. Protecting children from violence is an American value. That's the view of people from the most celebrated Republican president in the last several decades to a young boy in New York. In his farewell address in January 1989, President Reagan said, I've been reflecting on what the past eight years have meant and mean. And the image that comes to mind like a refrain is a nautical one. A small story about a big ship and a refugee and a sailor. It was back in the early 80s at the height of the boat people. And the sailor was hard at work on the carrier Midway, which was patrolling the South China Sea. The sailor, like most American servicemen, was young, smart, and fiercely observant. Young, smart, and fiercely observant. Looks like we have two of those here. The crew spied on the horizon a leaky little boat. And crammed inside were refugees from Indochina hoping to get to America. The Midway sent a small launch to bring them to the ship and to safety. As the refugees way, made their way through the choppy seas, one spied the sailor on deck and stood up and called out to him. He yelled, hello, American sailor. Hello, freedom man. And more than 25 years later, Alex, a six-year-old New York resident, wrote a letter to President Obama 
on August 21, 2016. Talking about Syria. He said, Mr. President, remember the boy who was picked up by the ambulance in Syria? Can you please go get him and bring him to my house? Park in the driveway or on the street, and we'll be waiting with waiting for you guys with flags, flowers, and balloons. We will give him a family, and he will be our brother. We will give him a family, and he will be our brother. That's the story of America. Let's all be freedom men and freedom women. Let's all give him a family so that he'll be our brother. That's the narrative for this great challenge today, just as has been the narrative for this great country for more than 240 years. Thanks so much. I look forward to ask, answering your questions. Uh, so I don't know if you guys could hear in the back, but the question was, uh, in light of the data suggesting that climate change is driving refugees, is, is that acknowledged and recognized among policymakers in Washington? Or is it rather just something that people think uh, is driven by war and, and other things? And I think it's, it's um, a little bit of both, um, which is to say that uh, I think in as much as uh, people have begun to focus on the uh, threat of climate change and the threat of um, mass migration resulting from climate change. Uh, that's happening as an institutional matter uh, in the agencies of government. So the intelligence community has done a lot of work on this over the last, course of the last several years. And for example, the Department of Defense is doing a lot of work on this. They are required, for example, as they factor by, by virtue of policy in the Pentagon, they're required to consider climate change as they make new budget decisions uh, because they recognize that uh, we could, as a result of climate change, face much different uh, basing assignments, for example, or much different questions as it relates to migration. Um, so in the agencies, there's a lot of work that's happening. And, 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 fr and frankly, I think the intelligence community and the Department of Defense are driving this debate in the government. Um, however, in other places like on Capitol Hill, there's just so little, uh, there had been so little focus on the question of climate change, let alone the individual facets of climate change, that it just hasn't uh, yet um, factored into the, the debate more generally. Hopefully that changes now um, with, uh, you know, uh, a, a greater degree of debate resulting from Democrats now controlling one of the two houses, um, and we'll see. Uh, but you know, time is short. Those those timelines that I talked about in the speech are they're, they're on top of us right away here. You know, these are well within your all's lifetime. You know, yeah. I, I guess I'd say three things. One is congratulations on your great work. I'm happy to meet you. I was reading about it as you heard me say. That's pretty great that what you're doing with the students. And thanks to you too. Um, second thing is I, I think that you know. We face a lot of questions about work and training as a society, uh, irrespective of whether we focus solely on, on refugees. <laughs> right? I think we just have to do a better job of making opportunities more accessible and affordable for all of our workers to get access to reskilling opportunities, whether that's English language training or coding or you know any number of things. And um, businesses can and should do that, as you're suggesting. Um, but my other view is this is a public policy question in a lot of ways, which is the governments have to get more serious about it. Um, and then the last thing is I think that's exactly the kind of innovative solution that's going to happen when the labor market's so tight. But I also think the experience of refugees in this country overwhelmingly is that even absent that training, as good as it is, um, refugees and immigrants find a way to innovate and learn language and, as the data suggests, find and grow businesses in a remarkable way. So um, 
So it's just a long way of saying to you, I agree with you. It's a Washington way of say, saying, yeah, I agree with you. I've gone Washington kind of here over the years. Yeah. There's a difference between uh, what we call refugees. A refugee is determined by the United Nations High Commissioner of Refugees to be a refugee. That is to say, somebody who is already outside of their country. So, for example, a South Sudanese who's in Uganda or a Syrian who's in Jordan or Lebanon or a Pakistani who's in Iran uh, or an Afghan, uh, an Afghan who's in Pakistan or Iran. Those refugees, we resettle all the time. And there's an established practice by which we identify those people where they are overseas in Iran, in Afghanistan, in Uganda, in Jordan, in Lebanon. And we run them through a security, somebody has identified them, we run them through a security, a, a series of security reviews, and we bring them here. And when they're here, they get three months of assistance. They get Medicaid, and then they get pushed into a network of people like RAP or people like Catholic Charities or Lutheran uh, Immigrant and Refugee Services or HIAS. And then they just become Americans. <laughs> uh, then there's an, a, a group of people called asylees. And most of the people now on the border in the southwest are asylees, that is to say they've applied for asylum. They have to go before a judge, and the judge determines if their claim of asylum is well-founded. And a claim of asylum is well-founded if, uh, if upon return to your country you'll face prosecution based on religion, ethnicity, sexual orientation, um, or I think that's basically it. If the judge finds that your claim is well-founded, then you're welcome into the United States. If the judge finds that you are not, you don't have a well-founded claim, then you're deported back to Honduras or China or wherever it is that you came from. As an asylee, you get certain legal rights, but you don't get any particular access to any social uh, infrastructure. So those are the two processes over and above other kind of legal immigration uh, options that you have. But overwhelmingly, the, the people on the border now, there's a massive backlog of people who have claimed asylum, and there's a backlog of cases to get before a judge for the judge to adjudicate their status. I hope that answers the question. Yeah. So the question was, in light of all the unaccompanied uh, children we're seeing at the border, uh, what, what kinds of things can we do uh, to more um, ably move them through a system that was not designed for them. Uh, one is I think we have to begin to recognize that uh, while the system is not designed for them, that it has to account for them. Um, two, I think the most important thing we can do is address root causes that are forcing kids to flee, overwhelmingly, uh, in, flee c Central America. Overwhelmingly, it's violence. Um, and, you know, in our, turn, our time in the government, we had dramatically expanded a, uh, investment in Central America, uh, aimed at uh, violence reduction, opportunity development, and so forth. So I think that's a really important thing. Uh, third thing is I think we have to increase, and this is subject to the ongoing debate right now in Congress, the so-called conference committee that's trying to resolve this issue that shut down the government. Um, it sounds like the, uh, the Democrats in that debate are insisting on an infusion of additional judges, resources for judges uh, and legal representation for people, including unaccompanied kids on the border, so that the system, as you say, not designed for this number of kids, uh, needs to up its level of resources that kids can draw on. So that's the three things I'd say on that. It's the, so the question was, the Holy See has commented that oftentimes these refugee or forced displacement efforts uh, oftentimes end up sapping the sending, the sending uh, countries 
or societies of their uh, much of their uh, uh, human capacity. So, you know, classic argument being that it's brain drain uh, from these places. So one is, uh, it's, uh, I'm not going to rebut the notion. I think the notion is correct. Two is, ultimately, that's part of a cynical uh, ploy by a government like, for example, the Syrian government, which wants to weaken political opposition so we'll make a concerted effort to force out community leaders, uh, to pressure community leaders. Um, and so I think that's just further affirming of the, the Holy See's point. Um, and then the last thing is, you know, w w one thing I learned in a briefing, and this is like 2015 or 2016, is that a an object that, Syrian refugee families in Turkey overwhelmingly had within their possession. The thing that most of these families had chosen independently to take with them when they fled was their house key. Right? They want to go home. <laughs> so the system is designed in such a way that the site of first refuge be temporary. Because, as I said in my remarks, that's really the only way it could work, given the huge numbers. But it also reflects the reality that a lot of refugees want to go home. And you can't blame them. I, do, I would want to, too. I want to get home tonight. Right? And so we ought to be working as diligently as we can, both in the refugee system itself, but then in our diplomacy uh, in our efforts to def diffuse regional conflicts uh, to make it possible for them to go home. So, and yeah, we go on the back here. That's what I'm talking about. It took us a while, but I knew I'd find one. Yeah, so I, I think what's ha what we're seeing is that when we take more, other countries take more, and then we've learned in the last year, as the numbers I suggested, uh, when we take fewer, other countries take fewer, which means that um, more of the most at-risk refugees will stay where they are. So what do I think the result of that is? Is increased suffering, increased, in, uh, increased instability, and the combination of those two things has generally meant wider regional conflict. And the combination of those three, three things have generally meant that we're under greater pressure to deploy our resources to manage the conflict. And so just arguing from a strictly realist perspective, I worry that it just is going to require more and more of our the deployment of our precious resources like uh, your classmates. And I think that's, that's not a good outcome. You know? Setting aside all the positive arguments, you know, we all came from somewhere. Right? Uh, as a country, we've been constantly refreshed by refugees and immigrants. And to stop that would be a big mistake, I think. You know? So not only would the international system be even more unstable, but I think we would cut ourselves off from a really important bit of re renewal and refreshment in this, in this country. It's a great question. So we got to know this very uh, in intimately, both because you know, our family, as I mentioned in my remarks, supported several uh, refugees, and my wife and I then uh, did as well. Um, but then during the debate in 2015, 2016, I spent a lot of time on, on the phone with governors about this. There's nine what are called uh, voluntary agencies or VOLEGs that over the course of time, one of, one of them is Catholic Charities, one of them is uh, the L Lutheran Immigrant and Re Refugee Services. So those agencies have a contract with the federal government. So when refugees come to town, they're assigned 
to one of those nine agencies. And then those nine agencies move those refugees to where there's um, ability to take them. So they'll work with Worcester Refugee Assistance Program or others and place them in Worcester or in Stillwater, Minnesota or in Tacoma Park, Maryland. And once they're there, as I said, they get three months of assistance, rent assistance. Uh, they get Medicaid, so they get health care. Uh, and then they get whatever support is provided by groups like RAP and, you know, ambassadors in the community. Then you're on your own, man. Three months, okay? You arrive here today, May 5th, you're on your own. That's a really short runway. Now, does that runway end every, at the end of three months? No, because there's great organizations like and great people like Professor Rogers, RAP, all of you who support refugees. Nevertheless, there's instances where, where that's it. And you know what? Those three million people since 1980 have overwhelmingly succeeded, notwithstanding that relatively light investment of support in their resettlement here. So his son is a fellow by the name of Ben Fishman who is as capable a policy analyst and writer and policymaker as I've ever worked with. And he's a relatively young man. I raise that because... The United States government is staffed by these highly capable, remarkable, patriotic young people, many of them like yourselves. And I'm here to tell you that Uncle Sam needs you. So as you're thinking about where you go when you leave the Mount, think about government service. There's a long track record of... Um, Catholic colleges generally, but Holy Cross in particular, providing really important national leaders, public policymakers, uh, to apply all the lessons you learn here about men and women in service to others on behalf of the United States government. So I hope you'll consider that. It's super interesting. It's an amazing opportunity as a young person to see a diversity of opportunities um, and the government really needs you. I mean, this is the deal, right? It's, uh, it's the you know first three words: "We the people," right? It's only it only works when we all do it. So I, I urge you to do it. Uh, and if I leave you with any thought uh, tonight, I hope it's that. And I hope you I hope uh, you really consider that. So now the substance of the question. Going back to 1980, in, in light of that massive outflow of, South, of Vietnamese, these were allies of ours in the fight between South and North Vietnam, um, those people who were associated with us in the fight, when we left, had to flee the country because they were at risk as uh, the communist Vietnamese took over the rest of the country. And we needed to establish a process by which we made determinations of how many people we let in every year and under what circumstances. And what's developed over the, pro the life of that statute is a process where the president estimates every year how many refugees we can take and resettle in the United States. He briefs Congress about how many he intends to take and then he proceeds to get as many of those in as his agencies can process. So at the, by the end of the Obama administration, we had stated that we wanted to get 120,000 refugees in. In his first two years, President Trump said he wanted to get first 50,000 in, then he said, I think, 30,000 in. Of those authorized levels, you don't necessarily meet the full number. So of the 30,000, I think they did 28,000. And of the 30,000, I think we're on track to meet far less than that. So the question just is, if otherwise the country is supportive of taking in refugees, how can the president alone 
insist on taking so few? And the answer to that is both practice, i.e. Article 2, the presidential power so far has, by practice, pushed out Article 1, the congressional power. Congress has not otherwise tried to force the president to take more than his authorized level. But our, the second thing is the president has the authority to direct his agencies to uh, pursue that number the way they, they, he intends that for them to pursue it. And you can't make the president or the agencies do something they're unwilling to do. And the, I would argue they're doing it based on a false set of arguments saying that they're, for example, need to do what the president calls extreme vetting. The vetting we have in place is quite significant. And as I said earlier in my remarks, there's been no incident of, of a refugee carrying out a terrorist attack in the country's history. So I hope that we can recognize that these are not substantive or reasonably intellectual arguments, but rather are simple, simply political arguments. And, and we just have to keep, this is why I said we just have to keep making the argument. We have to keep pushing uh, to make sure that we return to who we are as a country. So. We should take one more. Are you ready? Okay. Why don't we take one last one, and, we'll, and then we'll let you guys get back to, back to work, or maybe you can go eat in that beautiful refectory I saw. Excellent question. First of all, I want to tell you a story about uh, President Obama loves young people. He's come back from a visit to a college or just visit in town, wherever. So excited. This generation is so problem solving, so empathetic, so generous, so entrepreneurial. And I say, yes, and apparently so busy because they don't vote. <laughs> In the 2016 elections, 18 to 24 year olds voted at 24%. 18 to 24 year olds at 24%. I don't know, what do you get for 24% on a test? Here. St. John's, you know, you wouldn't have, you know, it's like a C. <laughs> Just kidding. St. Thomas Arrival, that's like an A. Um, it's too few. The powers in the Constitution are wonderful things. But none of them, none of the president's powers, none of the congressional powers, none of even the judicial powers, so Article 2, Article 1, Article 3, and none of the citizens' powers are self-executing. They don't exercise themselves. You have to exercise them, right? Now, 50.1, I saw a chart the other day, 50.1% of voters voted in the 2018 midterm elections. 50.1%. That's the highest in the last 50 years in all but three elections. That's great. So civic participation is on the rise, right? 50.1 is still not enough. So the first thing in response to your question, I just urge you to just to keep doing the wonderful things you're doing with Professor, Professor Rogers, that the great stuff you're doing uh, in terms of entrepreneurship and participation, but please vote. I don't care who you vote for, I really don't. But just vote. Second, uh, I get the, I used to, I get this question a lot, which is, you know, how does, what does the president, how does the president decide to spend his time? Is it 50% domestic? Is it 50% foreign policy? And, um, when we first got in the White House in 2009, you'll recall that it was the height of the recession and every day was massive crisis on foreclosures, on 
unemployment. And that was first and foremost the, the biggest demand the president was facing. By the same token, we had 100,000 troops in Iraq. We're ramping up our troops in Afghanistan. So my point is that the United States uh, does not, I believe, have the luxury of deciding when to be engaged overseas and when to just focus at home. We have to be able to walk and chew gum. And generally speaking, we've done that quite well. And to look at one as coming at the cost of the other, I think misunderstands American power. That we're strongest overseas when we're strongest at home, and our ability to be strong overseas increases our confidence at home. So these are a virtuous cycle. And to think that we can somehow shrink from our global responsibilities, like on refugees, and somehow maintain our historic position as a leader is a big mistake. And so um, that's, again, why I really hope that as you guys think about where you go from here, you think about government service, you know, because we need people who are understanding in the world, want to be engaged in the world, and are drawing on this great tradition of leadership and uh, interest in the common good. And so um, I can't thank you enough for the opportunity to be with you, and it's been really great. And um, it's, uh, it's as good to be up here on the hilltop as John Favreau said it would be. So um, I thank you very much.